Well, welcome to our longer format. Uh, I'm, of course, Jim Varenkamp, and I'm joined today by Andrea Powell. Now, let me get that. Yeah, um, yeah. Holly Andrea Coda uh, competed in track and field for South Dakota State University, originally from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Now she's a strength and conditioning coach turned PhD <laughs> candidate. What, what, how would you term yourself? Well, professor, I'm an instructor at the University of South Dakota now. Um, I teach everything in kind of the exercise science department, but then I am going to be starting a PhD in the fall. So I technically I'm not a PhD candidate until I pass the comprehensive exams in a couple of years, but on that path, I guess. Yeah. You're headed towards uh, greatness, obviously. So the <laughs> burning question I think some people, not everybody who watches this, are going to want to know, is it hard being a jackrabbit working for the coyotes? Um, it was initially. It's not as bad anymore. As you can see, I'm wearing blue today, and mostly just because it's a neutral shirt without either SDSU or USD on it. <laughs> I should have just worn black. Um, it was right away because everybody would give me a hard time about it. And I remember walking into the facility up at SDSU with like the first meet that I was there as a coach, all decked out in my red and all my former teammates were like, Oh no, you got to turn around, get out of here. And it was just, you know, everybody gives me a hard time, but now it's just so different because like I'm a jackrabbit at heart, but I'm just involved with athletics and I have been so much at USD that I don't know. It's just kind of like a different connection. So, but I will, and then I don't, it's a win-win when they play each other, I guess <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> uh, you know, my brother went to South Dakota state. He and his wife both went to South Dakota state. So anytime that USD plays, is, plays South Dakota state, I always am sending him messages about how terrible yeah. the jackrabbits are and all this other stuff. But it, it's fun because I think one of the things that in sports that that keeps people involved in it is is the the passion, the association. One of the things I talked about is the affinity for the school that you went for, that you feel that's irrational and rooted in all of the fond memories that you have from your experience. So it, it's just one of the fun things I wanted to just chat with you about. Well, I should have worn my, I do have like a house divided shirt, yeah. you know, that's like half blue or whatever, but I should have worn that. <laughs> do, do you, where did your husband go to school? Um, he, well, he played, he played football for a year at SDSU, but okay. then his brother, and then he didn't finish there, but um, his brother, Will, was a big stud at USD. So he's like a coyote. And that's also part of it too, is now that I'm a Powell, I'm like entrenched in USD now. So like now I'm there and it's just different. Like if I walk around tailgating at USD, I know most everybody, if I walk around tailgating at SDSU, like I'd know some people that go back for games, but a lot of my friends from state don't go back for a lot. So it'd be different if I had a huge group that was up there always back for games and stuff, but they're not really, it's kind of weird to go to those games actually, but. Hmm, that's interesting. I guess. Like, yeah, and, and the other part too, is you're so integrated into the actual culture of the school. Now, you know, people in the departments and yeah. those people that live in Vermilion and, and uh, that's, that's what the social life revolves around is, is the sporting. Right. Yeah. yeah. And just, I think knowing the coaches, like the coaches mm -hmm. are my friends so, cause I was a coach and a GA and I work down the hall from them. So it's just kind of a different, yeah, vibe. And those athletes are my students, mm -hmm. you know, like I don't really have a connection. I have some former athletes that I trained that are at state and I go for those guys and I follow along. I follow state and I, I go for them, but, um, it's different when like the kid I had in class yesterday is now out on the field and now there's one athlete in particular, the long snapper for USD, him and my husband kind of like, I don't know, doesn't pick on him on the sidelines, but they kind of met each other. And now they're like buddies on the, cause my um, mother-in-law has season tickets like in the second row on the 50 yard line. So they're like right there and Sean's just always hassling him, but it's kind of, it's fun. And that's what makes it kind of fun and why I think I feel a little more connected at USD right now, but I'll always be a Jack too. So <laughs> always be a Jack. Terrible words to say. I, I could yeah. never learn those. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I will say though, it is 
being, so I work at a small private school now and we're in a league of tiny private schools and there just isn't, we've only been in the league since I got here. It's eight, 10 years. There really isn't any rivalry, right? You know what I mean? Like they're like, kind of is, but they're just, it doesn't feel anything like what, what hate state week feels like. Right. You know? I mean, there's, just, I always well, go back. To, well, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you can finish. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say in 19, I think it was 1988. Um, no, that would have been NDSU in South Dakota. So in 1988, North Dakota State and South Dakota played three times in football. We played a home and a home. We beat NDSU at our place. They beat us at their place. And we played in the national championship. Like, talk about, yeah. like, that, that's the kind of stuff you want. Yeah. We, we yeah. Anything like that in our league. It's just, it's different. Well, and I think for me too, when I was at SDSU, USD wasn't division one. So yep. I don't really have that rivalry. Like we would go to USD for track meets, but I wasn't, we weren't competing against them at conference meets. Our NDSU was more of our rival. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really, you know, what I, so I didn't have yeah. that where I was always like, oh, hate USD and all that stuff. Because and that's me because I'm on the very tail end. I was in school and on the team in 2004, which was the last year that South Dakota State was in the old North Central Conference. Right. Mm -hmm. And like and our rival was North Dakota State. South Dakota State was in the league, but you guys were always like fourth, you know, third or fourth every year. Um, I think the last year in 2004, Mankato was third in like yeah. – or before that, we had never even considered Mankato as a potential rival. But then as soon as, as, soon as North Dakota State and as soon as South Dakota State left, mm -hmm. Mankato was immediately our rival because we just went back and forth with them every single year. And, and it yeah. But and like my – Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Dave Gottslave and the guy that I ran for always made stuff personal. And I never understood that. He'd be like, well, those guys at Mankato were talking smack about you. Like, what? Like, I'm good friends with all the guys I compete with, but he always tried to make it personal for some reason. And really? Some people fed off that and some people didn't. So I don't know. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, well, what's, what's all interesting is that Gatz, so, you know, former head men's coach at USD, Don Larson, who's retiring this year, or next that, year? This year next no, year? he retired this year, but that this is so much – and then was it who was at state before Rod? Not Danger, but anyway, they Dang. all were from was state. Was it Danger? Yeah. So that they were Dang. all from state. Yeah. You know, and Gats came down to USD and Don went well, up to NDSU and now they're all coaching Gats, against each other. Gots was not just they didn't just go to state, they were on the same team at the right, same time. Right, team. right, right. Yeah. And there, there are stories that I've been told that, the, that their rivalry began in college and had the association with the affections of a woman. And, and <laughs> I haven't I, heard that story, but I might have to ask Gotts. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if Gotts would tell you. I heard that one from some other people that are in the know, if you will. Maybe but, Rod or somebody would spill the beans. I was actually, we did a Zoom with like a bunch of SDSU track alumni and Danger was on there and Rod and when they did their fundraising thing, but it was kind of fun. I'm sure Rod would, Rod would tell you he like oh, salacious stories. He like has the best stories. Like Rod is the best. <laughs> He's the best storyteller. If you could get Greg Binstock in the same room or on the same Zoom call with Rod DeHaven, like those two I think would tell you, they would try to outdo each other on the dirt that they <laughs> For sure. I did have Greg. So Greg was my coach for a year and a half. And I was going to say back, kind That's of right. back to the USD, SDSU, like USD not being division one, I would have considered USD, but they weren't division one and they didn't totally have my major at that time. It was more like hyper, but I remember lucky recruited calling me and I was like, uh, well, you don't really have my major. All right. And I walked on at state, like I maybe could have gotten some money at USD, but I don't know. End up in red. <laughs> yeah, end up in red anyway. Uh, the good guys always win, right? <laughs> yep. Uh, so, I mean, that moves me kind of into our, our second topic is like how we got to know each other and, and our common passion, which is figuring out why our kids 
pull their hamstrings and what can we do about it and how, how do we fix something like that? So yeah. walk back a little bit. How did we even get introduced? Did it revolve around using cloud training? I think so, but I was thinking about that this morning actually. And I would assume that, cause I was like trying to be the cloud training expert cause nobody else wanted to figure it out and uh, kind of initially. And so I think we just talked on the phone and then started talking about what I did, which was more, I was programming all the strength and conditioning and all the movement and prehab rehab type things for the track team. And then I think we just kind of started talking about random stuff from there, but I don't, does that sound right? I'm not yeah, sure. That sounds right. I mean, the, yeah. the one thing that I thought that moved things along the most for us is when we were both at Drake relays, I yeah. flew up to North Carolina, you came over from, uh, from Vermilion and uh, you gave me 300 gigabytes of <laughs> just information wow. to go through and read. And like, I, I haven't gone through all of it. And some of it, I actually went and bought a hard copy of a book that I realized that either you had given me or somebody else had given me a scanned version of it. Um, yeah. But it really started my, my to pivot how I thought about things where I looked at not the specificity of the task where I would define it as running, but really breaking it down into pieces of movement mm -hmm. and the function of the body and how it should work and how to be able to like see your screen when it doesn't work. So yeah. how have things changed for you and like walk us through that, that, that process. How have things changed? What do you mean? How you view, like you started as a track oh. athlete in college. How did you go from there to where you are now and how do you think about movement and I will credit everything, most things I know about movement to Wayne Huber, Dr. Huber. So he's a chiropractor in town. He was my first, first job out of college. And he was kind of like, oh, you have this background? You want a job? I'm like, sure. I wanted to keep jumping for a year. And so at the same time that I was working for him, he worked or he was going through the fellowship of applied functional science through the gray institute so he was trying to learn all of this stuff so i therefore was trying to learn all of these things kind of with him so i ran his rehab program basically because he's a very non-traditional chiropractor um and also the sports medicine director for usa beach volleyball so he has like some clout like he knows what he's doing um, he's not just a Sioux Falls, smaller town chiropractor, yeah. I guess. I always got to talk him up because chiropractors get a bad rep. Oh, yeah. um, so I learned a lot from him. I did the certification in applied functional science. Um, but the way, like his eye, he just looks at things a lot differently. And then I want to do more strength and conditioning sports performance. So I left and then went to San Diego, um, to do some more sports performance coaching, coached. Uh, mostly guys training for the combine and things. And then I kind of got to get this like clinical movement analysis and then apply it to these like elite level athletes. Um, that was a great, also not great situation, ended up back at USD and then it was, you know, streamlining it into track. So something that I really understand. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think just kind of like understanding track and field and the basic movements and strength and conditioning, but then also having this like other thought process of if your hip hurts, it could be your hip, it could be your knee. Or if I, a better example would be if you have knee pain, it's not just your knee, right? So kind of taking a step back and it could be your hip, it could be your foot. And then it's just kind of all trial and error from there. Is it chicken or the egg, right? Top or the bottom. And that's kind of a lot of what the sort certificate of applied functional science teaches you. Um, so I did that while I was at USD. So then I was able to kind of learn these things and then watch my athletes all day long. So it was a good, I guess, learning experience. So, so answer the hard question. Why do people pull their hamstrings? <laughs> well, I was, I was thinking about this. So I have a question back to you and then we'll do our quick walk through it. So when in a race, do people typically tear their or pull their hamstrings? Mm. Let's take a hundred meter dash, right? Is it going to yeah. be in the first 30, second mm. half, middle? It's almost exclusively, I would say from about once you get into max velocity mechanics and you start to get either overreaching where people are trying to press and they start pushing flat and doing things wrong. And then 
I would also say when you get a little fatigue in there too, neuromuscular fatigue, where you lose a, a little bit of fine motor control. So I would guess people pull hamstrings from 50 to 80 meters. That's where I think I see it. Yeah. So 50 to 80 or beyond, right? So, and you're yeah. not, you're not going to accelerate more after 50 meters, right? We, we know that. Um, so you're decelerating, right? From 50 on or, or so, right? So the way I think about it is we got to go with like, when does injury happen? What's the mechanism of injury? And then work back from there. Kind of like an ACL, right? We know that ACLs mostly tear from deceleration, non-contact. Well, I'd say almost the same thing with hamstrings. You're going to tear a pull a hamstring when you're decelerating. So then my mind goes, well, if we're going to, if your hamstring's decelerating, which means that it's contracting eccentrically, right? Lengthening and contracting at the same time. Well, maybe it makes sense. And you and I have talked about this a lot. Maybe we need to train our hamstrings more eccentrically than we potentially do currently. Right. Hmm. So, and there's some research. I did just a kind of a quick thing. There's, there's research out there about traditional concentric training for the hamstrings versus eccentric training for the hamstrings. Um, and it's shown that the strength increases with eccentric training because eccentric training creates more damage in the muscle because you're basically pulling the muscle apart more. It causes more soreness, which sometimes people get a little nervous about that, but that's just, you created more damage therefore your muscle is going to recover and repair better stronger. what is the component in eccentric lifting that enhances the collagen production as well and remodeling of the collagen within the actual structure of the tissue what is well i just think it's because of the whatever damage you're creating i mean you have to recover correctly right well my question is so if i compare concentric work right, right. The, the up that I'm doing in a lift versus a slow descending. Why is a slow, is the slow descending enhance the collagen production just because it's more time under tension and you're getting micro tears at every piece of that, of that tissue? Um, I don't know, like for sure, for sure to say with oh, like, that, just ask what your opinion. that makes sense. That makes sense to me. Right. But also <laughs> just the mechanics of it is, so if we need, if our, body if our hamstrings need to be able to decelerate right we should train them in that way i think that that i think it just kind of makes sense to me that we should do that plus also you think hamstrings they're long muscles right they're long stringy muscles and to me like a long strong muscle is much stronger than a shorter compact strong muscle right because your hamstrings have to go through all the range of motion at the hip all the range of motion at the knee that you want them to be at their optimal length. So then that goes back to length tension relationship right. and things where we don't want to get too short or too long, right? You can be hypermobile and things, but you kind of want to find that soft spot of right in the middle. And, and we but, haven't even, you haven't even touched on what the function of the hamstring is in max flight mechanics. And that is to act eccentrically as a break for the femur as it swings forward back to full flexion. Yeah. Right. And that's, I think, the biggest thing it is it goes to almost any muscle. And so when I teach kinesiology, I teach it all. You know, we learn everything concentrically. What does this muscle do? Right. Your bicep does elbow flexion. But then I at the end, I flip it on its head and say, but in function, it mostly actually works eccentrically to decelerate that motion. Right. So when we do a pull up and just because you can see my arms, when you do a pull up or a chin up. Right. So your bicep is working to create that flexion. But when you go into an elbow extension, it's not your triceps creating extension. It's your biceps controlling or decelerating extension. So, and then you can apply that to hamstrings, quads, your gastrocnemius, like, you know, everything in the lower extremity with sprinting. Yeah. And that's where I think, and that's where it's hard to wrap your brain around it is I know what it does concentrically what does it do eccentrically which it basically just decelerates the opposite motion but it, when you're breaking down gait and there's a lot of other things involved it's it gets trickier well and the funny thing about gait too is so much of the motion is created elastically that mm -hmm. it's the reaction from the elastic reaction with the impact of the ground is then countered by an eccentric you know, a counterbalance of that, of that swinging free arm by the hamstring. 
Yeah. Um, the, the primary concentric strike in a, in a sprint is almost all exclusively generated through the glute as the extensor of the hip, correct? Yeah, yeah. That's but, what but I the interesting is that maybe that's... Maybe like a little bit in the calves, like a little from right. sicilius maybe and things. But, but I, would say, I would argue that that's elastic rather than... That would be like an isometric contraction that you're getting elastic energy as a return from in the yeah. stiff end. That's more the stretch shortening cycle. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but I was going to say one. I was going to say one more thing about hamstrings. hamstrings. I can't remember. Well, talk it's, to me a little bit about like the the one thing that for me I always thought growing up. Oh, I run with my hamstrings. That's the big muscle. That's what I move everything with. Why? Why? Why is that? Why do people think I pulled my hamstring because it was weak, or I pulled my hamstring because uh, you know so I got to go strengthen it? Why is it that instead of I'm using a muscle to do something it's not designed to do? And the other muscle, the glute, or the dysfunction that you see there, just the lack of function, mm -hmm. which is a result of me sitting in a chair 24-7 yeah. my whole life. Why is that so not apparent to people? I, that's a million-dollar question. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't, I don't know. And it, honestly, and when I've taught people, like, we want the movement, we want triple extension, and we want extension through the hips, it's like their mind is blown. And yeah. to me, you know, to you and I, it makes sense, right? Hip, hip extension, that's the function of the glute, right? But I just think, yeah, I don't know. I, and maybe it goes back to because hamstring injuries are so common that people then think that that's your primary running muscle. Your so then they, muscle, well, that's yeah. why we're injuring it. Where if we put our pelvis in the right position, again, going up and down the chain, if we put our pelvis in the right position, our glutes can function, then it takes so much stress off the hamstrings. Because if your glutes aren't functioning, your hamstrings will do the work of your glutes, right? It's your, your, the body's amazing and it will figure out a way to get the job done. So we can take the pressure off the hamstrings though by figuring out how to activate our core correctly, hold our pelvis in the right position, and then therefore use the glutes. Man. I know what I was going to say. I was going to say, yeah. and just always to remember is we always have gravity, ground reaction forces, mass and momentum, where you're talking about like the opposite leg and everything is gravity is always working on us. So no matter what we do, just to sit down in a chair, our muscles all work eccentrically because we're fighting gravity. So we don't just fall into our chair, right? Or fall down. So I think that's one of the big things is like mass momentum, gravity, ground reaction forces that are always working on your system. Hmm. And, and I would say my simple answer when people ask, why did I pull my hamstring? It's one of, it's one of two things, either glute dysfunction yeah. or it's range of motion in the ankle a lot of times, which puts you in a architecturally a bad position that, that transfers load up the system in a way where the system <laughs> can't handle it. Yeah, it could be. And that's kind of where you look kind of top or bottom, right? So just because you tore your hamstring typically is, okay, we need to ice it or do whatever to it. Well, what we need to do is get the pelvis in the right position and the glutes to turn on and then look below it at the ankle, the foot and ankle, and see where we're lacking there. Because, yeah, if you are lacking dorsiflexion, you can't pull your foot through. You don't really give your glutes a chance to work either. So it is kind of top or bottom who well, knows? If, some people if, fear towards the further out from this working even further out you, you mentioned the length tension relationship yeah i have my own central governor theory that that is all controlled by the the brain and it has to do with the brain's perceived risk factor right the brain is risk averse like the, the if fundamentally the subconscious brain is trying to keep us alive and well, it wants to maintain homeostasis. Well, we, we do risky things, but so let's just fall, just roll with me for a while okay. on this. But if, if the brain knows the glute doesn't work because we're sitting all the time, we're playing video games and it just, the brain shuts stuff off because it's not being used. Then people typically with glute dysfunction have shortened, tightened hamstrings, which creates a pelvis that's got anterior tilt then and so you've got all of these things that are occurring because the brain's controlling it. When I go in and palpate like certain regions, 
on just on your stomach, which is the thing that blows my mind, your stomach and there's some pressure points on the back of your head and stuff turns back on. I see a hamstring go from this to just in like 30 seconds. And that's where I'd like get kids that we always do this test where I just let me take your leg. I'm going to take it out. Maybe, Whoa, we're pretty tight right there. Palpate a region. And then like 30 seconds later, they're like, holy cow, my hamstrings feel amazing. And that's why I like, I go back to like the brain is subconsciously controlling all this stuff. The, the, where I went from that is I, I'm like, well, I can't just be beating on people's stomach every single day and you can't self do it. So there's gotta be a route to this. And that's where it goes back to motor learning or motor programming. We have to re-educate the movement. And that's where I feel like a lot of our conversations have gone is how do we re-educate those movements? And then Boo Schecksneider, I was walking with him from a class one time. And I was like, boo, like, I get all the stuff that you're talking about, but I've seen this where I can palpate some regions. Where in this programming am I teaching these movement patterns? And he just kind of looked at me and he was like, hurdle mobility, what are you talking about? And I was like, oh, we don't ever do that. We don't do it religiously. And I was like, that makes a lot of sense because it forces ranges of motion. It forces motor control. It forces proper execution of the firing patterns that we want to rehearse. And then when I get my kids to do it barefoot, it's amazing how it changes posture and their interaction with the ground. Where do you see it in other sports that don't do hurdle mobility that are similarly challenging those patterns and ranges of motion? Well, I would say that every sport should be doing hurdle mobility just because it's hurdles and that goes with track doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. Um, I've, I've always had my athletes do it, but again, not, not religiously on like a Wednesday recovery day or something like that, which is fine, but it's not, not probably enough. Um, the place that I did my internship at the Fisher Institute, they do hurdle mobility with all of their athletes every single day. And maybe there's something to that now. And now I'm, I'm literally just kind of putting those pieces together because to me, it was just kind of a warm up range of motion type of, cause they do it in the warm up. Um, where now I'm like, I should text Brett and ask him if that's his like point of it, or if it is just for more of a warm up. Um, but they were very religious with it. They would go walk through, everybody would have their own for certain things. Um, I think, you know, Yes, hurdle mobility can be the answer, but I don't think that's like the only answer, right? Yeah. So that might be Boo's answer, and that's prob and it is great. I don't disagree with that because I also think what you said is barefoot is key. Um, but I think it comes down to a lot of motor learning is initially teaching the right motor patterns, right? Yeah, so every day, all day long, yeah. Right. So I feel like when I get a new athlete, let's say I get a junior in high school right so she's got a like a big track season coming up or something or even basketball anything I always start with sprint mechanics and it's the most simplest most repetitive thing but every sport has to sprint yeah right and it's bringing it down to just not let's just hop on and just sprint 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 it's like we're breaking it down to the most minute little thing because it will overall make you one faster right everyone's get faster and it, prevent injury. So I always kind of take it back to the basics, but I always, I also go back to kids specialize really early these days and their parents want to see them doing all these cool drills. And I love Instagram and Instagram is great. I, I love social media, but the things that are on social media aren't the boring, like ankle pops that I'm doing with my athletes. You know what I mean? Like they're the cool things and that's what everybody wants to do. And it's, that's great, but what kids need to do is they need to, one, play outside in an unstructured way where they learn how to run and do things, and then when they get to that level of needing to learn is making sure that they're learning how to run and move properly. Uh, and I've got, a, so we, I've got a son that's one. Yeah. And I, so you're getting to watch all of these motor patterns. Oh, so yeah. I'm that's excited what I'm, for that. <laughs> and I'm letting him, I, like I'll kind of challenge him with certain tasks where it challenges his you know, ranges of motion and challenges his work capacity, you know, just all these different things that I'm thinking about, but he's just yeah. like, I'm, I'm jumping over cones and I'm jumping up and down off of this or I'm throwing. He, he, he does med ball throws every day. He's, we got a basketball, he picks it up, it's going slam, picks it up, it's going slam. And he just, I'm looking at that. I'm like, this is exactly what my high level kids 
that are throwing, you know, national championship level javelin throws. This it's the same work that they're doing. And yeah. for his for his size, like I'm like, this is great. I have so much fun to structure like the training from a an intentional way, but not, you know, I'm not trying to train him to yeah. be in it. I'm just challenging his his capacities. So um well, believe it's interesting. Not, Kid movement, though, is like, are we at our time? Is that yeah. what you're going to But I was just going to say, though, kids, and there's pictures out there, is a kid has a perfect squat. Yes. And we become 12-year-olds, and we can't squat. You know what I mean? So it just, I know this is kind of going off, and I hope I answered your questions about motor learning, but um, I don't know. It just, I think what some of that comes down to is, if you're letting kids be kids and discover how to move, they'll figure out how to move, right? And then if we need to tweak and adjust, we can. But I, I'm kind of an anti-specialization type person. I'm more of a play all the sports, try everything. Um, and that's coming from, you know, a strength coach that does the specialization. But I always say, try everything, do everything. And we can work on the skills, right? Everybody has to sprint you can learn how to shuffle, you can learn how to squat and hinge at the hips. And if you can do that, like, you'll do pretty good through high school. And then we can go from there. Right? Well, I, I saw we were, you were mentioning Instagram, and I, I follow it's like hashtag mobility training, or it's a hashtag that I follow. Mm -hmm. So it just all kinds of random stuff gets filtered in there. And there's one, there's a woman and her daughter that are on there that are just doing general strength movements and, mm -hmm. and I'm just blown away at the work capacity that this girl who's maybe five years old can do and and I think there's a lot of fear with parents of like oh I don't want them to lift weights too early it'll stunt their growth all these just misnomers these fake news things that are out there so I let's well, let's you have that. the dad that's like my seventh grader needs to be benching 135 my so you know, squatting this, and it's like the kid can't even do a push up or <laughs> hinge well, at the like what his endocrine levels are. Not. Yeah, what are his endocrine levels when he's in seventh grade? You're not, I mean, the dude is not just like pumping with testosterone at that point, he's going through puberty where he's all of that energy is getting pushed into growth and he's changing. I mean, as soon as you hit maybe you're at about 15 or 16, then I'm like, yeah, let's start banging some weights and putting on some muscle because I think the body is physiologically prepared for that. But I, I'm going to cut this off because we're at 32 minutes. Darn it. Uh, well, <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> the conversation is great, but, but what I'm saying is like, let's just no, this is good. Ourselves and let's keep the conversation going. And uh, next time we won't talk about South Dakota and USD or South Coast State. <laughs> we'll talk about uh, more motor, motor learning stuff, those type of tasks. Uh, but Thank you so much, Andrea, for being on here. I'm going to stop this recording. We can continue talking afterwards, but uh, we'll be back. We're going to do this format, quick 30 minutes, just to give you some, uh, some content, very diverse uh, people group that I'm working through. I've got a, uh, my friend, John, who is a Marine, who's going to talk about leadership here as soon as I can get him on here. Uh, we talked with Chris Parno. I, I've got another idea. I'm going to bring my dad on here and let him tell some stories, uh, tell some of the best stories I've ever heard. And we'll get him on here and he can talk about Dave Burrell's first time shooting a deer. But again, thank you, Andrea. And I'm thank gonna, you for having me. It was fun. Yeah, I'm going to stop it with that.